I finally discovered the power of the vacation rental marketing machine that was already in place. And I tapped into it and life has been great ever since. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single-family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And Mike Murphy at J.B. Harrison Insurance, helping real estate investors to understand and choose their best options for all their insurance needs. Call 616-868-0050 or email mikem at jbhins.com. Hello and welcome to episode 160. Short-term rentals, like Airbnbs, are getting a lot of interest from investors because of their potential for multiplying your income. And my guest today, Beth Carson from Vacation Rental Profit Lab, helps investors and vacation rental owners make as much money as they possibly can out of their investments. She's worked in the industry for 18 years, working with many resorts and high-end homes, and she's helped investors go from losing millions a year to being profitable in one month. Beth will also be one of our featured speakers at the Michigan Landlord and Real Estate Investor Free Conference and Expo of 2019. It's the largest landlord and real estate investor conference in the Midwest. It's happening right here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, February 21st through 23rd of 2019. And you can go to rpoaonline.org to register for free. Beth is going to be speaking that Thursday, February 21st. I can't wait to hear what she has to say. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Beth, thanks so much for being on the show today. It is a pleasure being here with you. Short-term rentals, I want to hear all about them, but before we go there, I'd, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Uh, what, what can you tell us? How'd you get into real estate investing and, and how'd you discover short-term rentals? Well, no one starts out in first grade saying they want to be a real estate investor in short-term rentals. And so, like a lot of people, I fell into it by accident. And it was, now I've heard other people say I fell into it by accident. I saw friends doing it, so I decided to do it myself. That's not really falling into it by accident. I went to Fiji. I was a travel agent. I was a single mom, and I was staying home to support my daughter and be with her, and went on a familiarization trip to Fiji, which is where you get up at seven in the morning, have breakfast with the general manager, do tours all day of hotels, restaurants, and then by 11 o'clock at night, you fall into bed at a different hotel. And I liked Fiji okay. Um, I wasn't seeing the beautiful water and the palm trees um, that I had expected. And we took a three-hour drive on a bumpy road, which has now since been fixed, and it's an easy drive. We all had headaches. We were all exhausted, and, and the consensus was, this better be worth it. And we arrived at the northern tip of the main island of Viti Levu, and it was like a postcard had opened up life-size in front of us, and it was beautiful. I had been to 35 countries at that time and had never felt the urge to buy a place somewhere. And the next morning, we actually stayed two nights there and were able to fully relax. The resort owner, he only had 16 what they call burrays, which are tr traditional thatched roof um, cottages, asked if anybody wanted to go up and see where he had an expat community planned. And so myself and two others scrambled up the hill to where he had this vision and if Hollywood had been involved, choirs would be singing and the clouds would have parted <laughs> and I would have been glowing because I fell instantly in love. And even though I didn't have two pennies to rub together, I knew that, that I just wanted to buy a piece of land there and build a little house. And so within maybe a year, year and a half, I inherited some money, not enough to retire on, but enough to make a good investment on. And my mother kept saying, why don't you buy a place in Florida? And I said, well, 
it's not Fiji. It there's something magical about Fiji. It's the same land mass size as Hawaii and only gets 1% of the visitors. So their culture is really intact. And um, so I flew over for six nights, tramped all over lots and the resort owner who said he would manage the property and with his stock of berets guaranteed me 25 percent occupancy and he would take half the, the money for managing it and to me that that was a break even so i was okay with it um, and he thought i should be up higher where the view was better and you could see the different changes of the water and i was drawn more towards land that was oceanfront we were still probably 30 yards up and had to build a staircase down but you had a good view and i was out on the lot that i ended up buying and one of my neighbors drove by and he said they're not making oceanfront any more oceanfront property and i thought that that's it I, I've, I've got to have this and so in the building process, which that's a whole other story, um, the resort was sold and the new owners planned to double the size of the boutique resort and they wanted nothing to do with this vacation rental. And so f it takes 24 hours door to door if you don't stop in California kind of halfway through and catch your breath and um, get a hotel room. And so I was 24 hours away and had no idea what to do with it. I was researching dive magazines in Australia and New Zealand to try to figure out how to market this. And I finally discovered the power of the vacation rental marketing machine that was already in place. And I tapped into it and life has been great ever since. So the power of the vacation rental marketing machine uh, what was that power? What, what did you discover? Well, originally, vacation rentals were set up in just certain areas of the country. One of them is the Outer Banks of North Carolina, which is close to where I grew up in the D.C. area. And we would get kind of the Sears catalog of vacations every year. And you'd have a little tiny black and white photo of the house and a very brief description and that's how you based your vacation well in 1995 vrbo was a family-run company vacation rental by owner and you could buy a listing on there and um, put pictures up write descriptions and there were travelers eagerly seeking out the vacation rental experience. So all I had to do was put a listing up there. It's gotten a whole lot more complex now, but I was able to get, I started marketing in March and I got my first booking for June within a week and it was the entire month of June. And I got $2,000 for it and I thought I was doing really well. Right now I can get for that same season, I can rent out four nights and make $1,850 for four nights. Wow. So there has been from beginning to where I am now, a huge learning curve. And um, one of the things I'm just excited about is sharing it with other people because I'm a traveler and I call the travel industry the business of hopes and dreams. And we really have to treat people's vacations carefully. We can't be cavalier with what we provide them. But when you up level the experience that your guests can have, they will come back, they will pay more, and you'll fill more nights. And you, I mean, it's the, the returns are amazing what you can make per night. Well, let's talk about that a, a little bit. I mean, because it seems like with your place in Fiji, you uh, you could have maybe rented it out year round to somebody, but you, you really felt like doing the short term rental was going to be more more lucrative. Uh, how how much more lucrative was that to to do a short term? Well, we had a Category Five 
of hurricane hit us about two years ago, and it was recorded as the largest, as the second most powerful hurricane to make landfall on Earth in recorded history, but the recording stations broke. So it's very likely the most powerful one to ever make landfall, and it made landfall at my house, oh. went directly over us. So my net, we're still kind of climbing up a little bit from that, but in pre Cyclone Winston, I was making an additional, after I paid the mortgage and the staff and all the bills, I was putting $2,000 a month in my pocket for no more than 10 hours of work a week and generally more like an hour. That's over $200 an hour you were making if uh, you were only putting 10 hours a week into that or, t or 10 hours a, a month. What exactly do people need to know about getting into the short-term rental business? The main thing that I tell people, uh, because hotels are being, their livelihood is being threatened by this because people are, once they stay in a vacation rental, they're 70% more likely to stay in a vacation rental again within the same year. And so hotels are feeling the pinch. So they're putting a lot of pressure on city councils all over the world, actually. And so you have to make sure that it's legal and kind of have your ear to the ground on anything that city councils might be coming up with in the future. And if you're in an HOA, you need to make sure that it's a friendly area towards vacation rentals, that they're not going to rule you out because that, that really is becoming a problem. I live near Asheville, North Carolina, and they and I lived there for 20 years, but they became very unfriendly towards vacation rentals and you can only do it in the central business district which is very pricey um, so we moved 20 minutes south to hendersonville north carolina which the city council is very welcoming of the tax dollars that we're bringing in and we are doing so well down here we have a five bedroom and then we have 200 yards away from it we have a 336 square foot suite that we rehabbed from a single car garage in a bedroom. We have a blinged out spa bathroom and it's tiny. I thought I could make between 90 and 110 a night, but in high season, I'm making 220 a night. And this also, this 336 square feet during high season is paying our mortgage because it's a du we've turned our house into a duplex. They have their own entrance. They have a deck with Edison lights and shower curtains, so they have privacy. We bling that out. But it in high season, so for about seven months of the year, it not only pays our mortgage, it puts $1,000 in our pocket every month. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Green Property Management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. And be sure to stop by their booth at the RPOA's annual conference. It sounds like your niche is like renting out uh, a, a whole house or an entire unit as opposed to kind of the Airbnb strategy where you can just rent out your couch or a space and part of your house. I mean, what, what exactly do you look for when you invest in a short-term vacation rental type property? Well, I'm finding, and I have a background in real estate investing as well as travel marketing and I have rehabbed houses and what I'm finding the sweet spot is the, and what I call them cougar properties, the kind of 1960s small kitchen, small bathroom, small closets that today's families don't want to buy make ideal vacation rentals if they're in the right location because you can bling out a tiny kitchen, a tiny bathroom, 
and you know they only need 10 hangers and a small drawer or two to put their clothes and these you can really make fun with color and decor but you can get them for a bargain because they're just not what today's families are looking for so describe uh, you know one of your recent acquisitions or a recent process you went through and in, in finding one of these cougar pro uh, properties and blinging it out i mean what uh if you don't mind you know just kind of share what uh, the numbers might be and what what kind of return you might think you would get on that well, the most obvious one was, you know, we have one of those 1960s ranchers. We love to walk to downtown Hendersonville, listen to live music. So so that's where we're looking for more real estate is within a half mile of downtown. And so we took, well, here's an example. You can also rent out your own house. And so when we went to Italy recently, I was able to use points for my credit card to fly us over and we rented out our own home and the decor is eclectic and fun and we pulled everything out of the drawers, put it in suitcases and then just locked the closet and then found a um, rack that you could put into a stud so they could have 10 hangers and then a luggage rack and they had all the drawer space and we just locked everything away you can rent out your own home with your stuff in it but you get more money as a true vacation rental and i only did the listing on airbnb but we had an entire trip to italy paid for by using our own home as a vacation rental and it's it's a it's fun, it's eclectic, it's funky, but I really didn't even do anything to bling that out. And we plan to go to Europe for two months in the spring and we'll be doing the same thing with that then and should have almost all of the trip paid for, at least accommodations, by renting out our own home. What I did with the other half of the house was I blinged out the bathroom. We took what was a laundry room and I bought almost everything from Wayfair. So it was delivered right to our front door, but I got a double soaking tub with a center mount drain. And I wanted a five foot by five foot window. And the guy doing the work said, well, he had a four foot by four foot that his wife wanted to get rid of. He'd give it to us for $200. And we were gonna have to wait on the five by five. So I said, let's do that. And we put glass farm doors in and you step up because we had to be able to put the plumbing under there because it was on a concrete slab because it was a garage and you've got when you walk in you've got the european wand and the rain head shower head or you can step into the bath and the bath has a floor mount um faucet and um, wand to wash your hair and then you can open the windows and look out onto the meadow and there's nobody behind you. And then I've got a chandelier. We painted it green, a fun green. And then my husband had the idea to paint the ceiling in even darker green. And then we did white crown molding. And I, I mean, it's just beautiful. And that is what people are booking for. They, I, we have all five-star reviews pretty much. And they all say, they came for the bathroom. When it comes to rental property insurance, understanding the cost, choices, and benefits can be overwhelming, and finding the right insurance provider can be frustrating. I had one company cancel five of my policies all at once for no good reason, and that's why I'm happy to have Mike Murphy from J.B. Harrison Insurance on my team. Mike is an independent agent who has always been able to find the right policy and the best provider for my insurance needs. Over the past five years, Mike has not only become my go-to insurance agent, he's also helped me manage risk risk, add value, and save money. If you are looking for insurance on a new acquisition, or you believe it's time to get a more comprehensive look at your entire portfolio, then Mike Murphy is the independent agent to call for all your insurance needs, auto, home, and business at 616-868-0050 or email mikem at jbhins.com. When you talk about blinging out your, your property, are you, are you really going for like the higher end finishes, the higher end looks so you can get the higher end paying customer? Well, one lesson I learned when I was rehabbing was you definitely don't want to use con contractor grade 
materials. But my girlfriend and I rehabbed a house, a couple houses together and we would go to the clearance section and buy something. So it had a lot of style, but it may have been the only one left, like the only um, lamp, ceiling lamp left. So, and that would, that would be what caught people's eye. When they walked in, they said, oh, you know, it's not contractor grade. Look, look at that, that's interesting, that's beautiful. So you can go high end, but you can also, because because our part of the house hasn't been rehabbed. The guests get the good stuff and we just were happy together in our 700 square feet and we um, we just make sure the guests have the optimal experience. So when when people paid to stay on our side, it's still a 1960s bathroom. The kitchen isn't upgraded and they're just happy for the location. So, but I've got the decor is really cool on our side of the house. So that's what attracts people plus the location. The premium that you get over when you bling it out and you have the higher end finishes over a contractor grade or just uh, standard type finishes. Is it worth the added investment to do that? Absolutely. I mean, you can, a, a can of paint is the same amount whether it's white or purple. So take your bathroom and paint it purple you know, and put a put a chandelier that you get in off of the clearance section or an open box section and you can bling it out inexpensively. Um, what people are looking for on vacation is different from what people are looking at for long term. So let, let's say you put, let's say you make an upgrade and one that would make sense in a long term rental because I was a landlord of 16 properties long term. Um, let's say you do stainless appliances and you put in $3,000 in getting all stainless appliances. Probably you're only going to be able to increase the price by $100 a month, I would say. W would you agree with that? Do you think that's kind of what your market would bear? Yeah, I mean, in, in a lot of neighborhoods, yeah, that, that sounds about right. So I put, I spent $3,000 on a hanging bed in Fiji and I was able to charge an extra $50 a night and I was booked extra because that became our cover photo hmm. and so since 2009 and these numbers sound crazy but I have done them and other people have done them this is accurate since 2009 with a $3,000 investment I have made $112,000 Wow and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but figure an 80% occupancy because up until the, the cyclone, that's where I was. I was at, I was 80% occupied. And so you times each of those nights by $50 over the last, what is that, nine years. And then I was able to book a little bit more, book a few more nights um, a year, a few more weeks a year because of this feature. Plus it added to my reviews, people were happy, and that was something that they talked about. I mean, the return has been incredible. So all because you spent $3,000 on a hanging bed, um, that just kind of upped the perceived value, uh, you know, that you could show through photos um, that people would talk about, and that right. has made you over $100,000 in that, yes. that $50 premium you're, you're, you're able to charge over what you would normally charge? Yes, since 2000. Yeah. 2009, you know, not obviously all in one year, but since 2009, the total has been $112,000. And so anything that you can do that makes you stand apart, like um, for the suite, the bathroom is what really does it, as well as location. Um, you know, people being able to walk into town and not worry about driving back if they've had a few drinks or just wander into town and shop. Um, whatever you have, you really need to play it up. And it doesn't mean you have to spend a lot of money. I mean, it could be your, usually your cheapest space is your outdoor space. So having a fire pit, if um, I wouldn't do that in a house where children would be, but, um, but then not only have the fire pit, but then have marshmallows, chocolate and graham crackers, as well as sticks or some other way for them to toast the marshmallow so they can have that experience. 
And, you know, that would probably cost a total of a hundred, you know, a hundred to three hundred dollars, depending on if you um, dug into the ground and put pavers around it. But, um, you know, hammocks, um, an outdoor deck with Edison lights going over it and curtains. I mean, just getting creative and think what, you know, people want an experience. And the deck we built was just 10 by 10. And um, I got furniture from Home Goods and Target and fun outdoor pillows. And so that whole thing probably cost $500, including the wood. My husband built it so the lab there weren't, weren't any labor costs. But though it photographs really well and that's important the idea that people want an experience that you just said it's like when they go on vacation they're paying for that experience and if you can show them through like just investing in a hammock or a fire pit like you just said uh, they can picture themselves having that experience yes. and they're more likely to, to stay at your place yes yes people need to get away people need to relax and the more you can show them relaxation or on the other spectrum, people need to be stimulated. Um, so if you can show them how you're close to town, you have a vibrant nightlife, um, you know, just it's, it's understanding the market and what people's motivation is for coming. Well, yeah, and it also helps to just understand the user experience because I know when I've stayed at VRBOs or Airbnbs, I spend a lot of time just looking at the photos of the yes. different options that I have. And and you're you know, yeah, I think you, you just put it perfectly. I'm looking for the experience that I want to have. And uh, I you know, I know if I saw a hammock in there, I'd think of my kids having fun on that hammock. So I'd I'd be more likely to choose the property with the hammock. Um, you know, obviously location is important, but what are some of the other things that people who have vacation rentals, uh, may be overlooking when they're marketing their, their property? Professional photography is one I see over and over again. There was a case study done and with one property in gosh, Branson, Missouri with professional photos, he brought an extra $20,000 in the next year as opposed to taking them just with his phone because a good and you like you can't use a wedding photographer they have to understand indoor lighting and they have to take multiple photographs with a tripod of exactly the same position so you can get balance the light inside against the light outside you know if i take a picture it's either going to be the room is going to be lit or and the the windows are going to just look like um, light coming in or I can touch the window and you can see the golf course that's outside but the room looks really dark and scary. So somebody who's an architectural photographer or a real estate photographer would be good and then staging is really important um, and that's that's something I see people overlooking because bad pictures you you have two things to grab people when they're on the listing sites you have the thumbnail photo so you get one chance to show off the best of your property and then you have the listing title and a lot of people are searching on mobile so you've got to have you know the first couple words have to say so much and if you start out with and i see this all the time in places like say panama beach city florida they'll say atrium 302 and that's all they have is their listing title well i don't know anything about that building that that tells me absolutely nothing so they have just wasted that real estate and but if you start out with um free beach gear incredible view and on my one for fiji i think i actually started out with ah private pool, hanging bed, maid service. And that's all I have room to fit in, but that says a lot more than Atrium 302. <laughs> yeah, you really want to paint a picture. Yeah. Spending a little extra money on those professional photos and, and putting a little extra thought into just the wording that you're going to use to, to help attract people to your property, that can make a big difference. Um, what are some of the mistakes you see people making? Um, I think just thinking the house is enough 
like multi-generational travel is becoming very big and people want to stay in the same home. Um, so let's say you have a big house and the grandparents are paying for it. If you got a croquet set, a badminton set, and a, what is the bean bag thing? The, the Be you bean talk? bag toss. Uh, yeah. yeah. If you got those out and set them up, I mean, you're, you're talking investment of less than $100. That tells you you're going to have family time right here at the house. And of course, you've got to keep up with it. I always buy double or triple of what I have. So when it gets worn out, I can replace it easily. But you know, just something like that is so easy. But if you if you buy it and put it in the closet and never open it up and take a picture of it, you might as well not have it. Um, I think they, I think also they miss in the listing description. You have to write to woo the travelers. You can't just give them a, a list of amenities. The other thing is people are now searching by date. They're putting actual dates in before, you know, the city, the date, and then the number of people. And then they can also check down by amenities. And so if you haven't filled out the amenity boxes and you have access to a shared pool, but you haven't clicked that and they click pool, but it's in your listing description, you're not going to show up if you haven't clicked that, if they narrow the search down to only places that have access to a pool. And so another thing is people don't respond quickly. My response time is under an hour. And there's a lot, if, if I look and somebody has a three day response rate, I'm not even going to bother with them. They're, they're not professional. And there are a lot of changes to the industry and you can work up your way in the ranks, you know, get higher and higher in the searches, the better your metrics are. Are you responding to people quickly? Are you accepting instant bookings? Are you um, keeping your calendar up to date? Um, and I, I know for investors, it's a real mind switch to go from passive income to, and this is what I call really the the income is massive on this, and this is fun work. Occasionally, you'll get somebody, and I just think they're just people that just shouldn't travel. But occasionally, you'll get one of those. But if you have a good house and it's sound and all the systems are working, you you and you painted the picture appropriately, you haven't taken a picture of the beach but then neglected to put in the caption that it's 10 minutes away by car. You know, you can certainly put the beach, but you have to be really clear, we are not on the beach. And I, so I see people be purposefully misleading and, and that's, that's not fair to a traveler, especially with Americans only getting an average of two weeks off a year. You have got to blow them out of the water and make them ex Decided to not only come to your place, but the experience at your place has to be really good too. Yeah, that's a good point. Are you handling the bookings and the management yourself, or do you have a team or a management company that you work with? I do it all myself. I have one in Fiji, two in Hendersonville, and then three that I manage for somebody else, for a client in Tulum, Mexico. So I've got a wide range of experience on what people are expecting, but if I'm out of town, we do have somebody locally for our two Hendersonville properties, but for the other four, I'm on all the time. So the Tulum, Mexico, it seems like you could handle the bookings remotely, but do you have a team on the ground to take care of the yes. property? We, we finally got a good property management company and that can make or break you. And there's nothing better than being on the ground for finding out local intel and i'm an introvert so my husband and i were at the pool and i'm reading my kindle and my husband is in the pool and he's chatting with this couple and they are bragging about their management team and he comes up to me and he says we have got to talk to this guy darren so we invited darren up to our the condo and we were just wowed so we talked the owner into transferring 
management over to him and our first guest, the hot water heater broke. He took his own hot water heater out of his condo, brought it down to the guest because this was a Sunday night and it was going to have, they were going to have to order the part on Monday and not get it till Tuesday. And they had just come in from Europe. So they, and they had two kids, hmm. they, they just couldn't go without water. So, I mean, he, on a Sunday night, took his hot water he heater down and gave it to them. And then, I mean, it's just, once you get great staff or a great management team on the ground team in place, you just praise the heck out of them, give them bonuses, treat them really well. Cause that's, I, in Fiji, when I have to leave, I always hug my staff and say, "Take care of the guests for me." You know, you're you're the you're me to the guests. Take and and we just get bragged on for our staff there. But I've put, poured a lot of time and energy into them, and they know that I respect them, and it shows. Yeah, how do you go about, and how would you advise our, our listeners who have vacation rentals or want to, uh, uh, how would you advise them to find the best management company to take care of their, their guests? Really just talk to other owners, because if they're, if they're not satisfied, they'll kind of pull a face and say, well, it's going okay. But we, I mean, I'm almost hesitant to tell people about Darren because he's so good and I don't want him spread too thin, but really just being around the neighborhood, talking with people and then really communicating with them well. And then, you know, when Fiji, I get a lot of feedback, whether it's good or bad, and I share all of it with the staff. So if they praise the staff, the staff all get the copy of that email. Or if there's something that wasn't handled well, I'll let them know that the guest was unhappy by letting them read the email. One thing that really clicked with my staff in Fiji, because they're, it's in such a remote area, there's no property management company that I could have gone with. I had to build my own staff, was I said, you know, I may be the owner but I'm not the boss. You know, we have 50 bosses a year that come here and they're, you know, and I showed them on the internet, the pictures, and I said, this is what they're expecting. And so you and I are both working together as a team to make these people really happy. And cause they thought by using torn sheets or stain sheets that they were doing something good for me and saving me, me money not having to replace them and I said look at these pictures there's no stains there's no rips so we have to provide them exactly what the pictures show and and they got it since you're talking about your Fiji place what's the status of it now after the hurricane is it back up and running or are you still working on it yeah no it's back up and running but there was so much press about how bad it was that um, people were just more reluctant. We had it back up within a month. Um, and I went over there and my neighbor, next door neighbor, um, Allie Howie, who owns Bularangi, she and I sent out a, um, a letter to, or an email to all our past guests. We had a GoFundMe campaign and people, we raised 10,000 US dollars. So I went over there and I went to REI and got a bunch of water purification kits, um, water tablets, and then went with one of her staff members and we went around, We I would start in the grocery store every day and we'd load up with diapers and flour and water and anything we could think of. And then she would say, okay, this house, they have a baby. So we, you know, but th there were people, this was two weeks after the incident. And basically my staff said, don't come, you know, they need resources for, you know, like the roads weren't passable. And so as soon as I could come, but th these people hadn't been reached for two weeks. They had no food. They had no shelter from the blazing sun. And so that was just a really special way that, um, and we collaborate, we share, you know, I helped her when she got into the industry. And if we can't accommodate somebody, we'll pass, 
you know, references back and forth, but um, we're, we're definitely back up and running, but it's just the, the, the press was so wild over it that, um, that people are just kind of coming back to Fiji slowly. The numbers haven't built up quite yet, but, but we're having a good year. So the perception is that it's still recovering from the hurricane, but, but the message you want to get out is that uh, you're open for business. We are. Yeah. Yeah. And it's good for the staff, too, because um, I helped the maids create a menu. We costed it out. And so they get money in addition to what I pay them. I pay them monthly. So whether we have a, you know, booked 30 days or we're booked five days, that would be a really crazy month. But um, they know that they have have the same salary that they could count on and they can budget, but they can make extra money by cooking meals. And I don't take any of that. So I like to support the locals. That's great. So you're, you're doing some good in the community where you own the, the rental. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, Beth, um, you're going to be speaking on February 21st, which is a Thursday, uh, 2019 at our, our annual Michigan Landlord and Real Estate Investor Free Conference and Expo. For those who are able to attend, are in the area, or, or will be in the area, what would you say to them about why they should come hear you speak? I think there's a lot of fear. Investors have a lot of fear about jumping into the vacation rental industry. One of the biggest things I hear is, what if I get a double booking? And you, you can sync your calendars. So if somebody books on Airbnb, it shuts off your home away and your flip key calendar you know, closes off those dates. And there's so much technology supporting this industry and this industry is growing. And it's a way to be an entrepreneur. And, you know, like, cause if I hadn't put that $3,000 into the hanging bed and worked on the design and everything, I would have 112,000 less dollars than I have been able to work with for the last nine or 10 years. And you can change your future and, you know, OPI or OPM is something that's standard in the real estate industry, you know, having other people's money pay for your investments. Well, I use happy travelers funds because what people will spend on rent for a month is generally what they will spend on a week accommodation on vacation. So if you can find a place that has a really good high season and a good shoulder season, and I'll talk about what to look for, the six things that you need to look for that to make it a great vacation rental. And one of them we touched on is it has to be legal and allowed. Like that's just, um, you know, but, it, but if you don't know that there's this sort of, um, tension brewing in certain areas of the country, you might not even think to ask that question. And so I want to help you. The learning curve I have had since 2005, when I took my first guess to where I am now, is I can help you shave well over a decade of learning and put, I, I just feel like I took $100 bills and burned them because I could have been making so much more money in the beginning. And the the money is really good. And it is a fun business to be in. And you're missing out. You know, landlord, you just cringe if the phone rings because it's never a good call. They never call and say, wow, I'm really enjoying, you know, paying you rent every month. Thank you for providing a place for me to stay. But ah, oh, the notes we get from the people that come for a night or a week and they just say, this has just been the best night of my year. You, you've just really helped me relax and my husband and I connected and um, it's, it's just a fun business and you can really change the course of how much money you get by your customer service, by your friendliness, by, and by what you do with 
your house. Great way to make money and make other people happy at the same time. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing you come speak at the conference, Beth, and I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Just to remind everybody, you will be speaking at the Michigan Landlord and Real Estate Investor Free Conference and Expo, which is happening right here in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 2019. Uh, it's the largest landlord and real estate investor conference in the Midwest, and you can go to RPOA online.org to register for free. It's rpoaonline.org. Beth, thanks so much for being on the show today and, and sharing your stories and experience with us. I am so happy to be here. And then also, not only am I speaking, but we'll have a booth and we'll be there the whole time and can answer questions and love to talk real estate and love to talk vacation rentals. Fantastic. And I know so many people are interested in the vacation rentals and the Airbnb. Uh, I think this is going to be a huge hit. Great. Looking forward to it. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And Mike Murphy at J.B. Harrison Insurance, helping real estate investors to understand and choose their best options for all their insurance needs. Call 616-868-0050 or email mikem at jbhins.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. 